Uh, right now, we've got the Web3 Leaders Roundtable. And so please give a warm welcome to Marie Flament, CEO of Near Foundation. She's been a leader in the fashion and hospitality industry, CEO of a bank, uh, really fun background. And Henry Holtzman, Chief Innovation Officer at MobileCoin, and moderated by Jeff Roberts from Fortune Magazine. So. Hello, hello, and welcome, everyone. We we're just talking backstage about how this is supposedly winter in a bear market, and there's 20,000 people packed into this place. It feels more like a Broncos game than I thought the industry was dead, so it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, the top of this panel, we've got a couple people who are very successful in conventional industries who are now in Web3, so we're going to be uh, talking about that, but I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Uh, Marik, if you want to just give us a quick bio, please. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a computer science engineer by background. I started my career in Asia working for LVMH. Uh, and then after that, I actually understood I understood nothing about business. <clears throat> I retrained myself, did an MBA, worked in strategy consulting, then for Expedia. And it's when I was actually at Expedia that I got headhunted to work for Circle. Um, so I worked for Circle between end of 2015 and 2019. Uh, and after that, worked in a bank, was CEO of a Neo Bank, and joined the Near Foundation that helps foster the Near ecosystem and community in January 2022. Hi, yes, I'm Henry Holtzman. Um, I work at MobileCoin. Uh, I have a background in computer science as well. I was at MIT uh, as an undergraduate, and then I went to this new internal startup there called the Media Lab at MIT right as it opened. Um, stayed there for another 28 years, so uh, I'm a little bit of a slow learner. Took me a while to graduate. Um, but while there, what we did was we thought about how everything would become digital and what that would mean. And then after everything became digital, we started to think about, okay, how do we reconnect the digital into our lives? Because we're physical beings. And so my specialty was really about human computer interaction. Um, took a jump out of MIT uh, to go join Samsung and really try to put some of these ideas uh, to work, reaching out to tens of millions of people with products, um, made new kind of TV that looks like a, uh, 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 a painting on your wall. It's called The Frame. Um, things like that, uh, and then got into AI there as well, where uh, we started doing intelligent assistance. Uh, finally decided I wanted to get back into like the really build things from scratch. Um, and the place that really attracted me the most was again thinking about um, what it means for something to be digital, and digital money in particular. So at MobileCoin, we work on digital money. And that's what, that's what we're doing now. Cool. Yeah, let's stick with that just one sec. Very quickly, both of you, I think MobileCoin and Near Blockchain are things, if you're in crypto, you've heard of, but might not be able to define exactly. So can you give us like a 20-second summary of what the Near Blockchain does and why we need it? And then uh, after that, um, Henry, you can do the same with MobileCoin. Yeah, perfect. So as of yesterday, actually, we're positioning NIR as NIR is the blockchain operating system. And what that means is that we all need better usability, front-end, back-end, and actually not just decentralizing back-end with layer one, layer two, whatever it is, but also front-end. And so that's what NIR does. The core and the heart of the blockchain operating system for NIR is actually NIR as the layer one, which is fully sharded, proof of stake, and therefore extremely sustainable and super fast. That's in 20 seconds. Very good. Yeah, and at MobileCoin, we wanted to create digital cash. And for it to be digital cash, it meant to us you had to have custody of it. Um, you had to be able to exchange it with other people privately. You had to be able to use it on the go. It had to be mobile friendly. And it had to be really cheap to do all those things. So to achieve that, um, we also created our own blockchain um, that's end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, works on mobile phones, um, and is uh, under ascent to do a transaction. What we're really focusing on now is the usability part. So we have a wallet we call Mobi, um, and in that wallet we're trying to make the simplest experience for paying people. And so uh, we kind of have these dual things. We have deep blockchain ex experience and uh, a real obsession with uh, ease of use. Great. Um, you know, in a minute, we're going to talk about you both. You know, came from traditional industries and are where you were lighting it up. Now you're in doing the same in crypto. But first, the topic of this panel is supposed to be Web three. And Henry brought up an interesting point before we kicked off. 
something about that term. Like, I think people still are not sure what it is. And then I was reading a, a good article the other day on how NFTs are kind of being rebranded on Reddit. No one talks about NFTs anymore, the digital collectibles. A little bit of the slime of Sam Bankman Freed is kind of unfortunately washed into over areas of the industry. So there's an effort to kind of rebrand things and re rethink how we talk about things. Web3, uh, Marie, do you think that's still the best term? And do you think that's going to be what we're calling it in 10 years? Well, one thing I've noticed is that, for example, back in 2015, when I got that call from a headhunter, it was to work in a Bitcoin startup. And so that's how actually blockchain and crypto was branded back then. And then that evolved into being crypto. And then that was also a word not used. Then it became blockchain. Then that was a word not used. Then it became Web3. So I think it's, it's almost like the industry self-rebrand itself and things happen. And you mentioned, you know, what happened with FTX and, and all that. And I'm just curious. So far, it seems to be sticking. I'd, I'd be curious to take your stake on Web3. Yeah, I'm, I, I tend to be curmudgeonly when some of these marketing rebrandings re happen. In particular, um, you know, I remember the transition from web to web two, and I would define it as the web became dynamic, interactive. It knew who you were, and it gave you content just for you. And so with that in mind, I think web three might be a stretch so far, but it, it really does tie back to it, because it is about how the web will know who you are. Now it is about, you know, um, I have my wallet, and my wallet has my keys, and it's in my possession. And if a website is going to interact with me and know who I am, it's because of my wallet, not because I gave them a username and a password. And so I see that transformation is like really making sense why we're calling it Web3. Um, how we pay for things on the web will transform. Um, ownership is transforming. Who owns the content? Uh, web3 is making those changes but i still like feel like at the at the core the web is about like that content based experience that i don't know that blockchain goes at the at the very center of you know Okay, well, let's ask the audience. Once again, the question is, Web3, should it be our go-to term? You know, and in 10 years, is that the best thing to call it? Will we be using it? So, uh, okay, well, quick show of hands. Web3 is what we want to call it, so it's going to be in 10 years. Ouch. Okay. Uh, <laughs> who thinks we should retire Web3 and come up with something else? Okay, well, I, I, guess, uh, I guess, yeah, I should take note of that because I'm the media and that's what I call it still. But uh, anyways, let's move on to a different topic. Namely, you know, you work for uh, Louis Vuitton and Hotels.com, which are both kind of cool companies, uh, Marik. What was it like going from that world into crypto land? Like, were the crypto natives nice to you, or was it hard to make that transition? <laughs> well, I think I was extremely lucky. My first experience in crypto was with Circle. And, you know, I worked with veterans who had actually created extremely successful Web2 companies. So that was my first experience in that. I think one of the things that I always found intimidating, uh, it's like the, the amount of jargon that is used in this industry. And actually, I think that's a blocker for having actually more, di more diversity and inclusion in this space because it's almost we hide behind all those terms like do your own research and, it, and I, I think actually it's completely unhelpful and so now I'm not, you know, I'm not shy when I say I don't understand and I want to understand what's going on, right? So, but apart from that, I would say what the ethos of actually Web3, because I think we're going to stick to that for now, the ethos of Web3 is extremely inclusive and it's actually whomever you are, you can participate in whatever project you want and I think that's extremely welcoming. Yeah. Um, well, how was it going from Samsung and MIT to crypto land? Um, uh, I am really enjoying the permissionless nature um, of being working in, in, in crypto finance. Like, MIT was kind of like that too. I, I, you know, academic independence let you do wide ranging things. Samsung, very like planned, structured corporate. And so, um, I am really, really enjoying being in a startup. I am enjoying being in the space. I am really excited about what we're building because um, for a, quite a while now, our finances have just been numbers and ledgers. But finally, those numbers and ledgers are, are becoming our own, right? We're owning them. We're owning the, own, owning the assets, owning the data around the assets. And I'm really excited to be working on making that uh, kind of transformation. 
Cool. Well, since we're talking about kind of traditional business, I mean, I had a you know cup of coffee at an MBA school for a year, and they're all about like competition and assessing like you know market share and who has what and stuff like that. One thing in crypto that struck me last couple of years is there are so many blockchains. You know, no offense to Nier, maybe it's the new killer one, but you know, sometimes I wonder. Like, I'm old enough to remember when the first search engines came online, and there was like 12 of them, and you didn't know who was going to win. But ultimately, it's a network effect thing, and a kind of a winners take most market. It. So just kind of putting on your conventional business hat, Marik, like, you know, do you think in five years there's still going to be, you know, 20 or 40 blockchains or is it going to get whittled down to like two or three? I think that's a really good question because actually I think right now one of the issues is that there's so much tribalism, right? And there's almost like, you know, my layer one is better than your layer one, like who cares? Because at the end of the day, if we want to really deliver on what we're defining as Web3, it needs to be a collective. And again, at the end of the day, the end user is not going to care what technology is under it. We open a web page, we don't, you know, we don't need to know what SMTP and HTTP and, and other underlying protocol are. So we are deeply convinced about actually a multi-chain world and actually where things come together. And again, as we showed yesterday and we demoed, the blockchain operating system is getting in that direction of you can actually now completely decentralize front end that are apps that are and dApps that are actually built on Ethereum. And then they can run on Ethereum, but actually they have a front end that decentralized on something that actually is within the near ecosystem. And I think that's the future. And so collectively, we have to get out of you know, our tribes and our you know, very small ecosystems to really fulfill the vision of Web3. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, the, you know, the analogy I would make is the Swiss Army knife. Do we want to build the blockchain that, that tries to do everything? Or do we want to have like that wonderful carving knife? Do we want to have the wrench? Do we want to have the screwdriver? And I think we're moving towards that world where we're figuring out how to interconnect these blockchains. And that is where maybe we're going we're gonna to fulfill the promise of web in the Web3 name, is because it's becoming a web of blockchains. And let each blockchain shine for what it can do well and um, host the applications that need those characteristics um, without having to think that there's one convergent blockchain that can do everything perfectly. Because I don't think that'll exist. Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, I'm torn. Sometimes I just think it'd be easier if we had, you know, Bitcoin's Bitcoin and it's not going away, and Ethereum seems to be doing everything. So do, you need, do we need anything else? Like you don't hear a lot about Ethereum killers these days, you know. But maybe that's just a reflection of the current market. But something you said about um, tribes. You know, I agree with you in the sense, I'm always, you know, as a reporter, someone outside fascinated by how blockchain people like to fight with each other, you know, and they're, you know, tribe versus tribe. But part of, I think, the strength of crypto is the tribes in that it gives people a sense of loyalty and belonging and energy. You know, just look around you at Ethereum, too. It's just, you know, it's so colorful and freaky and interesting. And, you know, Bitcoin's got their thing, you know, they're the kind of grumpy OG people. Um, and so is it possible maybe, you know, you need the tribes to make the blockchain blockchains sort of, you know, kind of succeed and work together. Uh, you want to take that one first, Henry? Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely critical mass, right, in anything you do in, in this kind of space. And so you need to achieve that critical mass uh, or else you're, it's kind of like you're building something and hoping people come to it and that doesn't feel good. So I, I definitely think that that's the case. And so maybe there, there will be some consolidation um, because maybe there are a lot of projects that don't have that critical mass and those projects will wither naturally. But that doesn't mean that there isn't always room for more and for more entrance and for more technology and for more good ideas. And those things will gather, uh, those will gather a flock. And, and the other thing is somebody doesn't, you know, in this world, you, you, you can be a member of more than one tribe, right? And so uh, there's no exclusivity. Nobody says, oh no, you, you, you can't own ETH and own Bitcoin. You, you can own both, right? And so I think there's room for both. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. And actually, I think it's, it's all a matter of perspective, right? So ultimately, we all belong to the tribe of Web3. Uh, and then within this tribe of Web3, then there is like, you know, smaller sub ecosystems that are trying to go to a broader picture. I think sometimes we lose track of that bigger picture and we tend to think that, you know, we are, you know, competing against it. I think really when I step back, what we're competing against is actually very large and broad players that we want ultimately to replace and to reshift how things are done. And so I think having the bigger picture in mind is really important. And then of course having your, you know, it's almost like when you play sports, you have your team, but you're also part of like, you know, the sports that you play and that's also your tribe, right? So I think exactly what you said, we can have different levels of tribe. 
I think my call to action would be for all of us not to forget that there is a bigger picture. And I think East Denver is a perfect example of that, right? How many ecosystems are actually gathering to have all those different ideas coming together to really realize Web3? Yeah, I like the analogy to sports, whether you like them or not. But, you know, every Sunday, if you're in Denver, you know, you'll see the Broncos tribe come out in force, even though they suck right now. I mean, they shouldn't suck, but that's, you know, another story. But, you know, of course, you know, just because you're a tribe of the, you know, part of the Broncos tribe doesn't mean you can't like football and be friends with the other tribes. So I don't know where I'm going with this. Um, anyway, so we're, we're running out of time, but let's, um, let's talk, I, you know, almost tired to bring this up, but we have to. Regulators, you know, we all know what's going on. You know, I've covered crypto for a decade. I've never seen anything like like this, the onslaught of, you know, Congress and the White House and the SEC, um, you know, a year from now, is it going to be better or worse, Henry? Oh, gosh. Um, now you've entered an area that uh, feels like Ouija board to me. Um, I have no idea. I'm going to be honest. I have no idea. I think we're seeing a world reorder because when you look actually at what's happening in Asia, and the movement on regulation, there is almost like a complete divide east and west on what's happening. And so I'm very curious to see actually what's going to happen in the US. But you know, it's not the only place in the world where builders can build and where actually innovation can happen. And so I think that's the game change that's happening. And over the last few weeks, we've seen you know, very big movement made by Hong Kong, very big movement actually also made in Japan. Uh, and so I think, you know, looking at that will be very interesting. In Europe, uh, MICA is also a different interesting take on, on what things are happening. And I think the call here for regulators is to think through the implication is actually talent movement. Because let's face it, having global harmonized regulation uh, seems as something that's probably completely impossible. And therefore, there will always be in the world a place where something can be innovated and created. You know, now that I've had a second to think, I want to tie, tie together your last two questions. Okay, the tribes, the regulators. I think one of the things that we see in the Web3 industry is that its primary users are the builders of those things. Um, and there's an area where it's started to grow past that, where people are seeing the value who don't have the deep technical knowledge to know what they're getting themselves into. Eventually, we want to get to a place where the crypto is just an implementation detail, right? The, the, the person who's getting the advantages, the benefits, knows nothing about the technology. And for that, we actually do need strong, active regulators who are looking to make the consumers safe. And so I actually hope that they step up to the plate and help us do that. Yeah, but I mean, I think Maurice's not wrong in that if the US continues this way, I think there's a real chance of developers voting for, with their feet and, you know, it's been a while since Europe's really innovated with much of anything, no offense, but, you know, it seems like America could lose, you know, a new wave of, you know, innovation to Europe and Asia, so I hope it doesn't happen, but it feels like a real risk. Um, looks like we're out of time, so we're going to do a quick lightning round. Uh, we're going to play overrated, underrated, three things, and that's all you can answer, either overrated or underrated. Um, uh, we'll start with you, uh, Marik. AI. Um. Underrated. Underrated. NFTs. Overrated. Underrated. The Ethereum Shanghai update. The what? The Ethereum Shanghai update. Neutral. <laughs> <laughs> Under overrated. <laughs> nice try, guys. I, I think it's going to be big. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. Let's have a hand for our panelists. Thank you very much.